Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below. If you are new here and you start enjoying what you are hearing or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help support the channel, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases Volume 11. Right after this intro and ad will play, before the first case, an ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, some of these cases contain material not suitable for all. Listening discretion is highly advised. The Pike County Murders, Family of Eight Massacred in Ohio. The Pike County Murders The 911 call came in at 7.49 a.m. on April 22, 2016. Bobby Joe Manley used a key to enter the home on Union Hall Road and arrived to find a scene of unspeakable horror, which launched the largest and most expensive criminal investigation in Ohio history. Eight Victims, Four Crime Scenes the morning started with Bobby Joe visiting the home to feed some pets for family members in rural Piketon in Pike County, Ohio. There, she found the blood-soaked bodies of Christopher Roden Sr., his former brother-in-law, and Christopher's cousin, Gary Roden. There's blood all over the house, she cried to the 911 dispatcher. Over the next few hours, police and family members discovered four more bodies in two adjacent homes. At 1.26 p.m., a man called to report that he had found the body of his cousin, Kenneth Roden, the eighth and final victim, who lived about a 10-mile drive away from the other victims. In total, there were four crime scenes. All eight victims were shot at close range. A toddler and two babies, one of whom was only four days old, were found unharmed at the crime scenes. The four-day-old infant had been sleeping next to her murdered mother in bed and was completely covered in her blood. All but one of the victims were members of the Roden family. Christopher Roden Sr., 40. Dana Roden, 37, ex-wife of Christopher Sr. Clarence Frankie Roden, 20, elder son of Dana and Christopher Sr. Christopher Roden Jr., 16, younger brother of Frankie. Kenneth Roden, 44, brother of Christopher Sr. Gary Roden, 44, cousin of Christopher Sr. and Kenneth. Hannah Hazel Gilly, 20, fiance of Frankie and mother of one of the babies found at the scene. Hannah Mae Roden, 19, daughter of Christopher Sr. and Dana, mother of the four-day-old infant found next to her body. Hannah also had a four-year-old daughter who was not present at the shooting. Investigation begins. With eight family members murdered in multiple locations, it was clear that investigators would need a large task force to handle a case of such enormity. The Ohio Bureau of Investigation was brought in, as well as the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Administration. Authorities immediately suspected there were more than one killer involved due to the elaborate nature of the killings and the fact that three different guns were used. Initially, they believed a drug cartel could have been involved because of the cannabis grow house found at one of the crime scenes. Some members of the Roden family had been raising chickens for cockfighting, which provided authorities with another potential motive local and premeditated. However, other signs seemed to point to perpetrators who were known to the Rodens. There was no signs of forced entry, and the manner in which the killings were carried out suggested the killers were familiar with the Rodens and their properties. Also, Dana Roden's two pit bulls were known to be fiercely protective of the family, but the dogs were left unharmed. 
Hundreds of tips flooded into authorities. By October 2016, then-Attorney General Mike DeWine and then-Pike County Sheriff Charles Reeder were publicly stating that they believed the killers were local, known to the victims and not part of any cartel or gang. DeWine called the murders the most important case going on in the state. Forensics expert Joseph Scott Morgan described seeing the bullet holes outside of Chris Sr.'s trailer and expecting a horror show inside. This was not a random act, he said. This is not a wrong place, wrong time scenario. You don't wind up in these locations by accident. It's a case involving a certain level of familiarity. Suspects emerge. By 2017, authorities had begun looking closer to home, focusing on one family in particular. DeWine and Reeder asked the public for more information on the Wagner family, who were local to Pike County but had moved to Alaska after the murders. Four members of the Wagner family were of particular interest to authorities. Angela Wagner, George Billy Wagner III, George Wagner IV, the older son of Angela and George III, Edward Jake Wagner, younger son of Angela and George III, and former boyfriend of Hannah Mae Roden, one of the victims. Jake and Hannah were the parents of a young daughter who had been staying with her father during the shootings. Arrests and Charges Police arrested all four Wagners in November of 2018. Investigators and prosecutors said the murders were premeditated, claiming the Wagners developed a detailed and elaborate plot to eliminate the Roden family. Timeline of the Murders On the night of the murders, authorities believe Billy, George, and Jake Wagner left Adams County sometime after 10 p.m. while Angela remained at home with her grandchildren. At the first crime scene, according to the investigator's timeline, Jake Wagner shot Chris Roden with a rifle as he stood outside his Pike County trailer home. Billy then shot Chris and killed his cousin, Gary Roden. At the second stop, the trailer home next door, Jake Wagner shot and killed Frankie Roden and Hannah Gilly. At the third crime scene, Wagner shot and killed Dana Manley Roden, former wife of Chris Roden, as well as Hannah Roden and her brother, Christopher Roden Jr., Frankie, who were the children of Chris Roden Sr. and Dana Manley Roden. During the last stop, Billy Wagner shot and killed Kenneth Roden, brother to Chris and cousin to Gary. Police also arrested two additional family members, Rita Newcomb, Angela Wagner's mother, and Frederica Wagner, Billy Wagner's mother. Both were charged with perjury and obstructing justice for lying to authorities, though the charges against Frederica Wagner were eventually dismissed. Motive Investigators believe that the motive for the killings revolved around one little girl, the young daughter of Hannah, May Roden, and Jake Wagner. Roden and Wagner had started a relationship when Wagner was 18 and Roden was 13, well below the age of consent. At 15, Roden became pregnant. Wagner was physically and emotionally abusive to Roden, as well as being jealous and controlling. When the two broke up, the Wagners pressured Hannah to give up custody of her child to Jake, something she vowed she would never do. After she moved on from the relationship and had a baby with another man, Jake tried to force her to falsely name him as the child's father. At the time of Hannah's murder, the child was only four days old. The Wagners were an extremely close-knit family, and they plotted the murders together to help Jake obtain custody of his daughter. They decided that if Hannah and the rest of her family were out of the picture, custody would fall to Jake. Pike County Special Prosecutor Angie Kanipa later said, The motive was a challenging one for all of us. We heard no one's going to believe eight people were killed over custody. To prove their case, they presented evidence showing that the Wagners had rigorously prepared for the killings. They bought ammunition, a magazine clip, brass catchers, and a bug detector. They also studied counter-surveillance devices on the properties 
including pets and tampered with phones, cameras, and parts of a home security system. The Wagner family even constructed a homemade silencer that was used in the shootings. Trial, guilty pleas, and sentencing. Angela Wagner pleaded guilty and received a 30-year sentence in exchange for testifying against other family members. Jake Wagner admitted to shooting five of the eight victims, including the mother of his child, while his father killed the remaining victims. After prosecutors agreed to take the death penalty off the table for him and his family, Jake pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against his father and brother. On the witness stand, he described his state of mind before shooting. I had decided I had no other choice but to kill Hannah. In September 2021, Jake Wagner was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. During his plea hearing, Judge Randy Deering told the confessed killer, It's not anticipated that you will ever be released from prison. Do you understand that? He responded, I do, Your Honor. George Wagner IV pleaded not guilty and his case went to trial. His mother and brother testified that, though he didn't physically harm any of the victims, he was involved in planning the murders and covering them up, and went along with his father and brother to the shootings. He was found guilty of eight counts of aggravated murder, and in December of 2022, was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences. After numerous delays, the trial of George Billy Wagner III is scheduled for 2024. Catherine Knight, the female Hannibal Lecter who ate her husband. Catherine Knight, a real-life monster. Catherine was born in 1955 in Tenterfield, New South Wales, as a twin with a sister, Joy. Her mother, Barbara, and father, Ken Knight, already had four boys and a dysfunctional family. Catherine's father was an alcoholic and was abusive. Catherine dropped out of school at 15, landed a job at a slaughterhouse, and was given a set of butcher knives. She was soon promoted to a boning position. Later, put them to good use in her life, murdering, skinning, and cooking her partner, John Price. Cannibal Killers While cannibal killers are rare, several notable cases have occurred throughout the years. This rarity makes it extremely difficult to analyze their crimes. Although most cannibal killers have been men, there are documented cases of female killers. Catherine would be the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life without parole in Australia. Along with the others was a notation, never to be released. Frontiers in Psychology identified common traits found in cannibal killers. Older than average murders, usually not related to the victims. Brain abnormalities present, low social and economic status, abandonment as a child, a need to dominate their victims, grew up in an abusive environment. Dr. Eric Hickey, professor of forensic psychology at Walton University, said that for cannibals, eating their victim gives them ultimate power. Catherine Knight's Abusive Relations In 1973, Catherine met David Kellett, whom she married in 1974. At the time, Catherine's mother advised him, you better watch out for this one or she'll kill you. Sure enough, on their wedding night, Catherine attempted to strangle David. It didn't take long before she was pregnant, and one night, she burned all of his clothes and slammed him in the head with a frying pan. Their daughter Melissa was born in 1976, shortly after David walked out of his marriage because of the abuse by Catherine. While walking the baby in a stroller, swinging it to and fro, neighbors called the police, who took her to St. Elmo's Hospital, where she was kept for several weeks. After her release, she took her baby to the train station and laid her on the tracks. Fortunately, a man saw what happened, grabbed the baby, and called police. Again, she was arrested and placed in a psychiatric hospital. 
she was released into the care of David and his mother. In 1980, they had another daughter, Natasha. A few years later, attempting to show David what she would do to him if he cheated, she grabbed a two-month-old puppy. I will not finish that sentence for the sake of everyone who is sensitive to that material. Unbelievably, in 1988, they had a third daughter, Sarah. Catherine and David also bought a house, which she decorated with animal skins, skulls, horns, and animal traps. Meanwhile, the violence continued. Catherine hit David in the face with an iron and then stabbed him with scissors, forcing David out of the house and into hiding. By 1990, Catherine was taken up with John Collingsworth, and a year later, their son Eric was born. This lasted for three years until 1995, when she moved in with John Price, called Pricey by his friends. John was a hard worker and well-liked by many friends and co-workers. Catherine moved in with John in 1995. Last Dinner with John Price in 1998, Catherine pushed for John to marry her, but he refused. In retaliation, she took a video of things she had taken from his work and showed the video to his boss, who immediately fired him, though he had 17 years with the company. In 2000, John took out a restraining order and told his co-workers, if I don't show up tomorrow, it's because Catherine killed me. When he didn't show up the next day, his boss sent a worker to find him. The police were called and found his body, with Catherine passed out next to him. One officer later said, By the time I got to the scene, Catherine was leaving in an ambulance. She had taken some pills. Not enough to kill her, but they made her sleepy. While Catherine was taken to the hospital, the coroner took John to the morgue. As the police searched the home, they found skin hanging from the top of a doorway to the bottom. Almost a full human body skin. Two placemats were set at the table with meat and vegetables on the plate. On the stove was John's head cooking in a pot with more vegetables. There were a number of slices of rump taken from his human rump, baked in the oven with some vegetables and put on plates with the name of two of his children on them. The autopsy report showed John had been stabbed 37 times with chunks of his flesh missing. When questioned, Catherine said she couldn't remember what happened. Psychiatrists deemed her fit for trial. It was set for October 2001, when Catherine pled guilty. Never to be released. At the end of her trial, a judge declared... I'm satisfied beyond any doubt that such a murder was premeditated. I am satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that her evil actions were playing out of her resentment arising out of her rejection by Mr. Price. Her impending expulsion from Mr. Price's home, which he wanted to retain for his children. He added, the last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. In November 2001, Catherine was sentenced to life without parole and a notation, never to be released. Today, Catherine is serving her sentence at Mulawa Women's Correction Center, Australia. Her children remain under the radar and wish to avoid publicity. Justice for Baby Angel Hope, Mother Guilty of Homicide Decades Later Baby Angel Hope After a week-long trial concluded on August 11, 2023 in York County, South Carolina, jurors found 50-year-old Stacy Michelle Rabin guilty of homicide by child abuse and the death of her baby daughter on August 12, 1992. She had also been charged with murder although the jury was hung on that charge. Rabin was arrested for the baby's death in 2021. The facts of the case presented were heartbreaking. Rabin gave birth to a baby girl she didn't want. Instead of exploring options like adoption, she stabbed and suffocated the child, 
wrapped her in a bedsheet, put her body in a Sears shopping bag, and threw the bag in the Catabal River. Although the baby had stab wounds, the coroner determined that her death was the result of suffocation. It was confirmed that the baby was only hours old when the bag was found by John Pierce, who was swimming in the river at the time. The community rallied and named the child baby Angel Hope so that she wouldn't be referred to as Baby Jane Doe. They also paid to have her buried at the Forest Hill Cemetery in Rock Hill, South Carolina. The case remained unsolved for almost three decades, but as time passed, as in so many other cases, DNA came to the forefront of the investigation and eventually revealed Rabin's connection to the child and the crime. Quote, Tonight, hours away from what would have been her 31st birthday, that baby finally got justice when a York County jury found her mother guilty of homicide by child abuse. News release from the York County Solicitor's Office. Rabin identified in 2020. In October 2020, detectives submitted DNA from the 1992 bedsheet to the York County Forensic Biology Lab for testing. The results identified Rabin as a suspect. Prosecutors said her DNA was in a national criminal database due to a previous conviction for drugs. Deputies obtained a warrant for Rabin's arrest for homicide by child abuse and murder. Rabin admitted to authorities that she had given birth to a baby girl inside a van on August 12, 1992, but told deputies she was not financially stable. In 1992, already had another child and didn't think she could take care of the baby. Instead, she claimed she gave the newborn to a couple for adoption and never saw the infant again. The jury, however, did not believe her, finding her guilty of homicide by child abuse, although the jury was hung on the charge of murder. Sentencing for Rabin's sole conviction will be August 21st, when she could be sentenced to life in prison. Although she could appeal the conviction, for now she remains in the York County Jail. Quote, I am very thankful for the hard work of our detectives and DNA analysts. Their dedication and ability to work cooperatively has led to the closure of a case that has haunted our community for years. While nothing can right this terrible wrong, there is some comfort in knowing that justice will be served thanks to the men and women who worked on this case. Kevin Tolson, York County Sheriff. Arrest Warrant for Rabin the arrest warrant for homicide by child abuse against Rabin stated that around August 12, 1992, she caused the death of her newborn infant daughter through abandonment, and the death occurred under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to human life. The warrant also stated that deputies based a probable cause to arrest Rabin on investigation, recovery of the baby, and other physical evidence forensic testing, and the statement of the defendant. Three Teen Killers Who Were Influenced by Media Violence What is Violent Media? The description of physical aggression in television, movies, or video games refers to media violence. Cultivation theory suggests that viewers cultivate much of the violence seen on television and apply it to the real world. According to the Nielsen Company, the average American watches roughly five hours of video per day, 98% being on a conventional television set. The majority of TV shows feature some form of physical violence. Even children's video games typically have some violent material. Media violence has been risen and escalating to dangerous levels. In this case, we will study the cases of three teen boys who committed murders inspired by violent media. Number one, Jacob Evans, the boy who shot his mother and sister. Number two, Michael Carneal, the Heath High School shooter. And number three, Mario Padilla, the teenager who stabbed his mother. Number one, Jacob Evans. 
Jacob Jake Evans was a 17-year-old boy who lived with his parents and three siblings inside the wealthy gated community of El Lido, Texas. His mother worked as a public school teacher. He was the only boy in the house, having two older sisters and one younger sister. Jacob and his younger sister, Mallory, left their schools to be homeschooled by their mother in 2010. Jacob had been disturbed by the behavior of his peers. He couldn't stand watching them bullying each other. He was also disgusted by the behavior in his family. He was not happy with his little sister because he felt she was transforming into a self-centered person. Jacob started thinking that his entire family felt happy belittling him. Jacob's sister Mallory made a racist remark about a black man who was trimming grass outside. Jacob got upset by her remark and lectured Mallory about her behavior. Identifying with the Halloween movie. As Jacob was nearing the end of his high school studies, he started thinking about killing those who were unfit to exist and wanted to harm each other. Jacob found himself fascinated by the slasher horror film Halloween, director Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of the classic 1978 film of the same name. Jacob admired how the character Michael Myers, the killer in the franchise, was so calm after he murdered several people, including a bully and his abusive stepfather. Jacob wrote in his confession to police, I was amazed at how at ease the boy was during the murders and how little remorse he had afterwards. I was thinking to myself, it would be the same for me when I killed someone. Day of the Murder On October 4, 2012, Jacob went to his allergist. After the appointment, he went for lunch with his mother and little sister. After getting back home, Jacob went into his room watched the movie Halloween for the third time that week, and started preparations for killing his family. After watching the movie, he trashed the DVD so no one could find it. After that, he went into the backyard and spent an hour playing golf. Mallory asked Jacob if he wanted to watch a movie with her. He was angry with her about her racist comments and declined the invitation. Evans put a knife in his pocket and considered murdering Mallory after playing golf and watching TV at home. But then he decided to kill his mother and younger sister with a 22 caliber revolver so they wouldn't feel pain. He went to his sister's room and said that their mother needed to see her. When she came out of the room, Jacob shot her in the back. She rolled down the stairs and he shot her again in the head to make sure she was dead. Then he went downstairs and shot their mother three to four times. Confession and Verdict On October 4, 2012, Jacob called 911, telling the dispatcher that he had just killed his mother and sister. He was arrested at the crime scene. Jacob wrote a four-page detailed confession in which he told about his thoughts and actions on the day of the murders. Jacob pleaded guilty to two counts of murder and was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Jacob must serve at least half of his sentence before becoming eligible for parole in 2035. He is currently incarcerated at the Memorial Unit Facility in Rocheron, Texas. Michael Corneal in April 1995, New Line Cinema released a movie, The Basketball Diaries. In the small town of Paducah, Kentucky, the movie evoked memories of terror and pain in a quiet 14-year-old boy, Michael Carneal. Michael belonged to a well-respected family. Michael was an average student but was not succeeding academically. He became isolated and was often intimidated by his fellow students. Michael needed companionship to overcome his anxiety and depression. A girl named Nicole became his friend and tried to change him by helping him with his homework. Michael's feelings for Nicole went beyond platonic, but she made it clear that she would not be interested in dating him. He was again rejected. Michael started spending a lot of time in his room and came across the movie The Basketball Diaries. 
he found himself relating to the main character, who hates his school and his peers. Michael had extreme feelings of sadness and loneliness because of the bullying by his fellow students. Michael wanted to teach them a lesson, just like in the movie. Michael stole his father's gun and brought it to school, trying to impress older students. A student took the gun from Carnell, threatening to tell the police if he did not give it to him. Carnell was upset and told students that something big was going to happen on Monday. Unfortunately, no one took him seriously. Shooting Carnell stole several guns from his house and a neighbor's house the week before the shooting. Carnell brought a shotgun and a rifle to school on December 1, 1997, passing them off as part of an art project he was working on. In his backpack, he had a loaded Ruger MK2, a 22 caliber pistol. Carnell rode to school with his sister and arrived there at around 7.45 a.m. He put earplugs in his ears and pulled the weapon from his bag as soon as he arrived. He quickly fired 10 shots at a group of students, killing three and injuring five. A student, Benjamin Strong, testified that Carnell dropped the gun after the shooting and surrendered to the school principal, Bill Bond. Carnell said to Strong, Kill me. Please, I cannot believe I did that. Fatalities in the Heath High School Shooting Number 1. Nicole Hadley was a freshman who played on the basketball team. She died at 10 p.m. on the evening of the shooting. Nicole's parents donated her organs. 2. Jessica James was a member of the marching band. She died during surgery at Western Baptist Hospital on the afternoon of the shooting. Three, Casey Stegger was a clarinetist in the school band and a member of the Agate Club and softball team. She died at Lude's Hospital in Paducah 45 minutes after the shooting. She was an honor student who hoped to be a police officer. Trial and Verdict In the trial, it was found that Carneal was bullied by other students and had anxiety depression, and severe paranoia. Following the shooting, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In 1998, Carnell pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. The plea was accepted due to his mental illness on the condition that Carnell would receive a life sentence without the possibility of parole. On September 26, 2022, the parole board denied Carnell's bid for parole and ordered him to serve out the remainder of his life sentence. He cannot be eligible for parole and will serve a whole life sentence. Michael Carneal is incarcerated at the Kentucky State Reformatory in LaGrange, Kentucky. The families of the victims claim the media violence inspired Carneal to murder and filed a $33 million lawsuit against two internet pornography sites and the 1995 film, The Basketball Diaries. Mario Padilla Mario Salvador Padilla was a 17-year-old boy who lived in Los Angeles, California. Mario and his cousin Samuel watched the newly released Scream many times, and they were both obsessed with the movie. They wanted to reenact scenes from the horror film. Mario told his cousin that Ghostface's methods of killing is the perfect way to murder someone. Mario was upset with his mother because she asked him to do some chores. So on January 13, 1998, Mario attacked his mother from behind, with his cousin holding her down. Throughout the investigation, psychologist Madeline Levine emphasized that the film served as a blueprint for the offender saying, you need a cat to copy. The movie Scream is that cat in this situation. Mario's mother, Gina Castillo, 37, managed to call 911 and tell an emergency operator that her son had stabbed her multiple times. Before she passed away, she was also able to call her husband and tell him about the attack. Mario stabbed his mother 45 times using four different knives. Trial 
According to the prosecution, the boys intended to kill several people in a similar manner, including Mario's stepfather and two neighborhood girls. Before their arrest, the girls had been receiving frightening phone calls and letters from them. The boys told police that the horror film Scream and Scream 2 inspired them to carry out the killings. Compton Superior Court Judge John Cherosky banned any mention of the movies in court. During the trial, it was revealed that Mario was upset with his mother and planned to steal $150 from her to buy the Ghostface costume. Mario also invited his friend Aaron Hernandez to take part in the killing spree. Aaron Hernandez rejected the offer, saying that he couldn't kill anyone. Verdict Mario was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. For his part in the murder, Mario's cousin received 25 years to life in jail without the chance of parole. Paul Golub, a public defender, said that Mario suffered from mental illness and had not been fit for trial. The judge denied this defense, saying that the slings showed careful planning and sophistication. According to his prisoner page on the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation website, Mario Salvador Padilla was granted parole in June 2022 but his decision was reversed by the governor in November of 2022. Padilla was again granted parole in November of 2023, but remains incarcerated, likely pending review by Los Angeles authorities and the governor of California. Disclaimer, this next case I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of but I'm going to read it anyway, as this case right here pissed me off to no end. Prepare yourself. Here we go. Chris Watts, A Father's Depraved Crimes On the afternoon of August 13, 2018, Nicole Atkinson and her teenage son drove over to her friend Shanann Watts' home in Frederick, Colorado, after the pregnant mother of two missed a work meeting and an OBGYN appointment that morning. It was unlike Shanann to be difficult to reach. The direct sales representative for several multi-level marketing brands, she was tethered to her social media account, regularly posting pictures and responding to direct messages. Shortly after noon, Atkinson called the Frederick police to the residence for a welfare check and also contacted Shanann's husband, Chris, to inform him of what was going on. He immediately left work, arriving home shortly after the police had met Atkinson outside. When the officer and Atkinson entered, they found no sign of Shanann or either of her young daughters, Bella and Celeste. However, they did find Shanann's car in the garage, as well as her cell phone and wedding ring, which piqued the interest of investigators. A picture-perfect family. To those who followed Shanann Watts' various social media profiles, they saw a picturesque home life in the quaint suburban Colorado town of Frederick. She had two young daughters, Bella, who was four, and Celeste, who was three, and had just announced that she was pregnant with a boy named Nico. These videos also featured her 33-year-old husband, Chris, who was often shown playing with his kids, helping Shanann around the house, and modeling Thrive Patches, which she sold as part of her work for multi-level marketing brand, La Bill. However, behind the scenes, cracks were forming in the once strong bond that Shanann and her husband had shared. Chris was focusing more on his job as an oil field operator for Anadarko Petroleum and spending a lot of time in the gym, working out and less time with his children. Shanann even shared these concerns with her friends, complaining that her husband was giving her little to no affection and that she was afraid that he was having an affair. Banished Without a Trace The FBI and Colorado Bureau of Investigation quickly opened an inquiry into the disappearances of Shanann and her two children. 
Officers combed through the home looking for clues, and neighbors were interviewed to find out if they had seen anything out of the ordinary. A next-door neighbor shared surveillance footage that captured Chris backing his truck into his garage at around 5 a.m., which Chris explained that he did in order to load up necessary equipment for that day's work on the remote oil site. However, no CCTV footage from any neighbors showed Shanann or her children leave the property, although CCTV footage from the Watts' family's doorbell camera showed Shanann entering the home the night prior to her apparent disappearance. Investigators were confident that Shanann, Bella, and Celeste never voluntarily left their home. And, as investigators began probing into the life of Chris Watts, they discovered a strong motive for murder. The Interrogation of Chris Watts After finding no evidence that Shannon and her children left on their own accord, and spotting no signs of struggle or forced entry, police immediately shifted attention to Chris Watts, who had by then given interviews with multiple local news stations, pleading for his family to return. However, in the interrogation room, Watts was not able to maintain the stilly demeanor he displayed during his television interviews. He maintained that he had nothing to do with his family's disappearance and was optimistic about their return. But when pressed about the details of his relationship with Shanann, Chris began to crack. Understanding that investigators had seized his electronic devices, Chris admitted that he was maintaining an intimate affair with a co-worker named Nicole Kessinger. Together, the two would go on overnight vacations, meet out for dinner, and discuss their plans for a life together after Chris left Shanann. However, investigators could see through this ploy to appear forthcoming and unlikely ask Watts to submit a polygraph test, which Chris failed horribly, according to the test administrator. Under the mounting pressure from the interrogators, Chris claimed that on the early morning of August 13th, he asked his wife for a separation. This is when Shanann flew into a rage and strangled both of her girls, prompting Chris to respond in equal measure by strangling her. He then claimed that he drove all three of their bodies out to a remote oil site, buried Shanann in a shallow grave, and stuffed his daughter's bodies into two industrial oil tanks. Chris Watts takes a plea deal. Chris's story of killing Shanann in response to her strangling their children did not last very long. Ultimately, he pleaded guilty to multiple charges on November 6, 2018, including three counts of first-degree murder, three counts of tampering with a deceased human body, and one count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy, due to Shanann being pregnant at the time of her death. Due to Watts' plea, the wishes of Shanann's family, the death penalty was taken off the table and Chris received five life sentences without the possibility of parole. In later interviews, Watts and his lawyer confirmed that the story he told investigators on the day of his confession was not true. Instead, Chris strangled Shanann after an apparent fight regarding his desire to get a divorce. Chris then collected Shanann's body and drove her out to the oil site with his daughter sitting in the back unaware of what was happening. Once on the site, Chris then smothered Bella and Celeste one by one and forced their bodies through the tight hatches of separate oil tanks. Why did Chris Watts do it? Although Watts could never justify the depraved acts he committed against his family, it is helpful to examine what evidence may have contributed to the man's ultimate decision to annihilate his wife and children. Of course, infidelity was a significant contributor. Between Bella's birth in 2013 and 2018, Chris had lost a substantial amount of weight and developed a love for fitness and sports, which Shanann could not engage in due to severe chronic illnesses, including lupus. 
This change in appearance and lifestyle eventually led Chris to develop an interest in his younger and more attractive co-worker, Nicole Kesslinger, who shared his passion and growing want for adventure. Additionally, the Watts family had significant financial struggles, having filed for bankruptcy in 2015, and they were barreling toward a second bankruptcy just three years later. Their financial troubles seemed to stem from living far above their means. From 2015 bankruptcy filings, we know that the Watts family made at around $90,000 annually, with Chris earning the majority of the joint income. However, they had a $3,000 mortgage and a $600 monthly car payment on top of nearly $70,000 in credit card debt, student loans, and medical debt. And while we don't know the particulars of the Watts' financial standing in 2018, the fact that the couple was due in civil court on August 24, 2018 for failing to pay their $1,533.80 HOA fee suggests that the family continued to struggle financially. Honoring Shanann and Her Daughters Though Chris would never speak publicly about what precisely drove him to murder his wife and children, those interested in the case believe that he wanted to restart his life. He yearned to live free from the financial burden of providing for his family and desired to have a relationship with Nicole Kessinger. However, because of his deranged narcissism, Chris could not simply walk away from his family and instead committed the ultimate act of betrayal by taking their lives. Shanann and her daughters were deeply loved by Shanann's parents, Frank and Sandra, as well as her brother Frankie, who was also described as her best friend. She looked forward to growing her career, and she loved being a mother before her life and the lives of her children were so callously taken away. Shanann's family have asked those who want to honor her life to make a donation in her name to the Lupus Foundation of America. Grace Mullane, British Backpacker Murdered by Tinder Date The Tragic Story of Grace Mullane Grace Mullane was born on December 2, 1996, in Wickford, Essex, England. She was the daughter of David and Gillian Mullane and grew up in a loving and supportive family with her brothers Michael and Declan. Grace was an intelligent young woman who graduated from the University of Lincoln with a degree in advertising and marketing. To celebrate her graduation and the start of a new life chapter, Grace embarked on the year-long solo backpacking trip around the world. Like so many young adults looking for formative experiences, she wanted to explore new cultures, meet new people, and have grand adventures. She posted excited social media messages in anticipation of the trip for months and then set off for Peru. As she started the second leg of her trip, Grace arrived in Auckland, New Zealand on November 30th, 2018 and checked into a local hostel called Base Backpackers. She'd been there for two weeks when, on the cusp of her 22nd birthday, she met someone on Tinder and planned a casual date. A date with Jesse Kimson. Jesse Kimson lived in a studio apartment at the City Life Hotel in Auckland. In the weeks before meeting Grace, Kimson had been using Tinder extensively to meet with women. His preference was rough sex, and he messaged various women about his fondness for feet, dominating, and strangulation. Colleagues and friends said Kimson became obsessed with online dating apps in his early 20s after being estranged from his mother. He was also a pathological liar who told people a variety of fake stories about his life, ranging from fabricated cancer diagnosis to gang and CIA affiliations to his job as a senior manager of mining and supermarket companies. 
After matching with Grace Mullane, the two plan to meet at a safe, well-known public space, the iconic Sky Tower, on the evening of December 1st. Grace spent the day exploring the city and capturing images of the sites, sharing them on social media. She arrived at the Sky Tower early and sent festive video messages to her family. Meanwhile, Kempson drank four beers at a local pub before calmly meeting up with Grace. They quickly changed venues to have drinks and dinner. The two were seen on CCTV footage getting along, conversing for hours, and even kissing. During the date, Grace messaged a friend, I click with him so well. That was the last time any of her friends or family would hear from her. One year earlier. Grace didn't know that a year earlier, a different young woman went to the New Zealand police to report her own disturbing Tinder date with Kempson. This woman, who was interviewed in a TVNZ documentary, said when she met the charismatic, confident Kempson, she was young, naive, and a hopeless romantic. During the course of only a few hours, however, his demeanor became aggressive and violent, culminating in his threats to stab her to death with a knife. After she filed a detailed statement about the encounter, police granted her both a protection order and a property order. But there wasn't enough evidence to bring charges, authorities said. The young woman's very violent situation would be too hard to prosecute because it was he said, she said. What happened to Grace Mullane? Grace was last seen alive as she entered the City Life Hostel with Kempson. She was reported missing by her parents on December 2nd, after they didn't receive a reply to her birthday wishes. As the New Zealand police launched a massive search and investigation, they began processing hours of CCTV footage and reviewing Grace's social media accounts. A few days after her disappearance, Detective Diana Levinson noticed a comment left on the missing woman's Facebook page. Underneath her profile picture, Jesse Kempson had written, Beautiful, very radiant. Kempson wrote the comment at 9.29 p.m. December 1st, the night Grace went missing. He immediately became a person of interest. Detective Levinson messaged Kempson, and they arranged to speak the next day. He told her about his date with Grace, but said that they had parted ways at 10 p.m. The next day, another detective spotted Kempson outside of City Life Hotel, chased him down, and brought him to the police station for a formal interview. He repeated his story from the night before. But after police acquired and watched the CCTV footage, a different version of events, the real version, became clear. A Timeline of the Murder After their date, Grace accompanied Kempson back to his room at the hotel. At some point after 9.30 p.m., Grace died, but no emergency services were called. At 1.30 a.m., Kempson began searching online for hottest fire and Waitakere ranges, where he later buried his victim. For the next few hours, he watched porn and took close-up sexual pictures of Grace as she lay dead. Kempson started the daylight hours on Tinder, arranging a date with another woman. Then he went out to buy supplies, two identical suitcases and a cleaning solution, which he said he needed to get wine stains out of his carpet. Finally, he bought a shovel. In the afternoon, Kempson met his date, who was a formal journalist, at a bar called Revelry. The woman would tell police she found him intense and unnerving, recalling that when she referred to a murder trial, Kempson replied, It's crazy how guys can make one wrong move and go to jail for the rest of their life. He reportedly then told her about a man whose girlfriend died during rough sex. By the time investigators watched the footage, it was abundantly clear that Kempson killed Grace. Faced with the evidence, Kempson admitted Grace died with him, but claimed it was an accident during rough sex. 
he said Grace asked him to choke her. A week after Grace's disappearance, on December 9th, the police located her body in a suitcase buried in a bush outside of Auckland. By this point, investigators had interviewed numerous people, but thanks to CCTV footage, they were able to determine that only one person was with her in the final hours and minutes before she went missing. Kempson's Trial Kempson was charged with murdering Grace Mullane. His trial started in November of 2019 and took two weeks. The prosecution called his last tender date to the stand and asked her about Kempson's statement on the day of Grace's death, specifically his story about a girl dying during rough sex. The woman told the court, I think he was in his own world telling the story. I think I just felt a bit uncomfortable. I changed the topic to traveling to the South Island. Prosecutors argued that Kempson was testing out his defense to see if people viewed it as plausible. The Fifty Shades Defense Another witness called to the stand was a British woman who testified that Kempson sexually assaulted her while she was on vacation in Auckland. She said that when she saw Kimson in the news, the details of the attack all came rushing back and her whole world came crashing down. Since the attack, she had experienced flashbacks and nightmares and often woke up crying and screaming. Quote, Every time I went to sleep, I'd see your eyes popping out of your head, staring at me in anger. Kimson's lawyers proceeded to argue that Grace's death was a tragic accident using a controversial strategy that is sometimes called the Fifty Shades defense. An eroticized death. However, the prosecution was able to counter this by establishing that it took Grace five to ten minutes to die. If Kimson had released his grip at any point, she would have recovered. Crown Prosecutor Brian Dickey also revealed that intimate sexualized photos Kimson took as his victim lay dead, saying that he eroticized her death. The jury, who also heard about eight other violent incidents associated with Kimson, deliberated for five hours before rendering a unanimous verdict of guilty. Upon hearing the verdict read to him by the judge, Kimson reportedly yelled, you have no reason to convict me. You're full of shit, mate. Sentencing. Jesse Kimson subsequently faced two additional trials for sexual assault and domestic abuse. These trials showed that Kimson terrorized his living girlfriend and further established his predatory controlling nature and his long history of violence against women. Justice Jeffrey Benning, the high court judge that presided over Kimson's domestic abuse trial, said to the convicted killer, Your mother rejected you. That may go some way towards explaining your attitude towards women. Jesse Kimson was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-paroled period of 17 years. In February 2021, Kimson's appeal against his conviction and sentence were dismissed by the Court of Appeal. At the end of her testimony, the British tourist who was sexually assaulted by Kimson when she was only 21 years old looked at her attacker and said, I am not scared. I am strong. I am not alone. I am loved. I have so much to look forward to in my life and I will not look back. You don't have any power over me anymore. Remembering Grace. Grace's family set up the Love Grace charity in her honor. The charity works to raise awareness about safety for solo travelers and provide resources and support to those in need. The charity also collects handbags and toiletries for women in need. Philippa Robson, who runs the domestic abuse charity to which many of the handbags have been donated, said that Grace Mullane's tragic case continues to have a profound impact on people.
and that your listeners brings it close to these true crime cases, volume 11. I'd like to take this time and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Knees. Thank you all for supporting the channel and your continued support. I'm going to read these birthday shoutouts again because I got some new birthdays in January and February. So, we're going to do our birthdays. January 2024. If I mispronounce this, I'm so sorry. Siba Sibasu, January 7th. Olivia's mom, January 10th. Kimberly Shepard, January 26th. Howler's mom, January 28th. Olivia's sister, January 30th. Now to the February birthdays. Letty, the second. Desiree Barber, the third. Lindsay Ray, the tenth. Hannah Jacobs, the fifth. Stephanie Austin, the ninth. Dominique, the 10th, who will be 18. Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> I hope you have fun. Lisa, the 22nd. JMS 430, the 22nd. Phoenix Fire. Yes, that's me, the 22nd. La Sparkle, the 24th. And Angela Conti, the 25th. The happiest of birthdays to you all. May it be a day full of love and celebration. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please take care of each other. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.